Almost everything you know about autism is wrong. TV shows often reduce and infantilize autism to just a socially awkward genius. I am a surgeon! I am a surgeon! Dr. Hahn! And beyond these stereotypes, it's also one of the most stigmatized medical conditions throughout history, often painted as a tragedy, a burden, and a disability. Autism destroys families. These are kids who, many of them, were fully functional. And in this context, many people have began pointing out that autism cases are rising at an alarming rate, with latest data from the CDC showing there's been a 32,158% increase in autism since 1970. You can't even believe these numbers. One in 10,000 children had autism. One in 10,000. And now it's one in 36. There's something wrong. One in 36. Think of that. So the big question is why? What could possibly explain this meteoric rise? In this video, I set out to understand what autism really is and how it actually affects people, as well as investigate the theories behind the rising numbers. Why are there so many people being diagnosed with autism? And what I uncovered shocked me because almost everything you've been told about autism is wrong. Autism has always been highly stigmatized, but I've been watching something strange happen online. There's been an interesting cultural shift with one side of the internet painting autism as this quirky personality trait. But then on the other side, you have voices demonizing it. These are kids who will never pay taxes. They'll never hold a job. They'll never go out on a date. So which is it, a quirky personality trait or a devastating disability? Well, the answer is neither, which is why we need to pause and ask what actually is autism? I think it's best conceptualized as a, as a difference in the way in which a person might experience, process or interact with the world. I spoke with Dr. Lang to better understand what autism is and how it shows up in different people. He's a child psychiatrist who specializes in neurodevelopmental conditions like autism. And by the way, he himself has autism. If there was a cure for autism, I wouldn't take it. So for defining autism, there's actually specific medical textbooks that outline exactly what to look for when diagnosing it, but their definitions are problematic. The DSM-5 describes it in very deficit-based language. I personally don't use that. Instead, Dr. Lang explained to me that when he describes autism, it's better to think of your five senses, touch, smell, hearing, taste, and sight. You can have hyper or hypo sensitivity in somebody who is diagnosed as autistic. For example, commonly an autistic person may have a hypersensitivity to sound and become overwhelmed in a noisy environment, or be hypersensitive to touch and find something seemingly normal like a hug overstimulating, which can cause distress. Flip that to the other side, if you're hyposensitive, then you might end up being sensation seeking. So the examples of that would be like deep touch, um, to some extent, perhaps stimming behaviors that autistic people often like to do so like rocking or, or you know repetitive spinning or, or something like that and with this difficulty in processing sensory information it often affects how an autistic person communicates which is where the socially awkward stereotype comes from you have no idea what it's like to struggle with recognizing emotional cues autism is thought of as a spectrum but people often throw around that everyone is a little bit on that spectrum and that's because when most people hear spectrum they picture a straight line from less autistic to more autistic but actually autism is best thought of as a color wheel with different colored slices each slice represents an area where autism can show up and the size and color intensity shows how strongly it affects that individual. Autism isn't about having more or less, it's about having different combinations and intensities of traits. One person may thrive in a structured routine but struggle socially, whereas another might be highly verbal but needs sensory support. Both are equally autistic, their color wheels are just drawn differently. And just because you might relate to one or two autistic traits doesn't automatically mean you're autistic. Autism is defined by severity and impact on someone's life. For some that means profound autism, where people are non-verbal and require support. How you doing buddy? How you doing buddy? Having a good day? Good day. Yeah? Yeah. Cases like this only actually make up about a quarter of all autism cases, with the majority of people like Dr. Lang living very normal lives. So what causes autism? Well, we know it's strongly linked to genetics because when scientists look at population-wide data, they notice that autism runs in families. Now, you of course might be wondering, how do we know this isn't because of the environment that people are growing up in? And that's by looking at twin studies, where scientists compare identical twins who share 100% of their DNA with non-identical twins who share only 50%. Both twins develop in the same womb during pregnancy and also share the same home, so environmental factors are broadly similar. 
If autism were mostly environment, then the number of identical twins that are both autistic would be roughly the same as the number of non-identical twins that are autistic. But if genes mattered a lot more, then the number of identical twins that both have autism, i.e. twins that share 100% of their DNA, would be more than the number of non-identical twins, i.e. the twins that share only 50% of DNA. And that is exactly what we see. If one identical twin has autism, the other is far more likely to as well. And the data suggests around 153 times more likely, whereas non-identical twins is about eight times higher. But this is where the confusion arises. If autism is caused by genetics, why are autism rates climbing so quickly? New data from the CDC that shows more children than ever are being diagnosed with autism. In the 1970s, it was about one in 10,000. And today the CDC said it's one in 31. Genetics don't change this fast. So what's going on? Well, the US Secretary of Health has been very vocal describing this as an epidemic. The autism epidemic, this is part of an unrelenting upward trend. And he's been pointing to something he thinks the medical community has been missing. This is coming from an environmental toxin. And somebody made a profit by putting that environmental toxin into our air, our water, our medicines, our food. So I set out to investigate whether any of this is actually true. Let's first take a look at the potential toxins in our air. Now, there are many different air pollutants which have been shown to be harmful for your health. And I actually made a much longer video on covering all of this, which you can watch just up here. But the main suspect thought to be linked with autism is a pollutant called PM2.5. These are tiny particles, 30 times smaller than the human hair that can enter our bloodstream through the air we breathe. At high enough levels, some studies do suggest that they may increase autism risk. And I don't think anyone would dispute or question how bad air pollution is for your health. But in the majority of places across the world, like the US and UK, since the 1970s, PM2.5 levels have been steadily on the decline. And it's the same with all of the other major air pollutants. So air pollution wouldn't explain the sudden surge in autism cases if it's actually improving. So what about toxins in our water? Well, heavy metals like lead and mercury are well-known neurotoxins and have been linked to autism at high enough levels. But again, the story is the same. This report looked at blood lead levels in US children aged 1 to 11 between 1976 and 2006. 16, and it found a dramatic decline. And it's the same with mercury. Toxins in our water are all going down, all whilst autism cases are rising. And this is the same for toxins in our food. Pesticide and glyphosate use are all declining whilst autism rates are rising. Now, microplastics are one of the only so-called toxins that are rising. But among the many credible health concerns and potential harmful effects that microplastics do have on the human body, there is literally zero credible human evidence that microplastic exposure causes autism. So if it's not toxins in our food, air or water, that finally leaves potentially toxins in our medicines, or more specifically vaccines. If science is so overwhelming on the link between vaccines and autism, it needs no further research. The idea that vaccines could maybe cause autism was based on a study published in 1998 by Andrew Wakefield. It looked at just 12 children and suggested that the MMR vaccine could cause autism through gut inflammation but it was actually later retracted as fraudulent. Medical journals aren't in the habit of saying they're wrong, but today The Lancet, a respected British publication, did just that. It retracted a 12-year-old study linking the vaccine from mumps, measles, and rubella to autism. Since then, because of the global scare that this caused, scientists have extensively researched to identify if there's any link to vaccines and autism. And every single major study has found the same thing. Vaccines do not cause autism. There was even a city in Japan that withdrew the MMR vaccine in 1993, but still saw that autism kept on rising. Another version of the theory is that actually the mercury is the thing that's causing autism, not the vaccines itself. And mercury should not be in vaccines. My grandson got nine shots in one day, seven of which had mercury in it and he became autistic in a very short period of time. Just to be clear, vaccines don't outright contain any mercury, but instead an ingredient called thimerosal, which is a mercury-based preservative. As a precautionary measure, it was actually removed from the majority of pediatric vaccines in the US in 2001. Yet despite this, autism continued to rise during this period. And large-scale studies have compared kids who got thimerosal vaccines versus thimerosal-free vaccines and found no difference in autism rates. The science is overwhelming. If toxins in our air, food, water, or vaccines were driving the rise, then autism diagnosis would have gone down as those exposures were removed or declined. But they haven't, they've gone up. Now, I do support a continued research to identify if there's any modifiable risk factors for autism that we've been missing. And science is always evolving with new discoveries. But right now, all of the evidence points to the rise in autism not being driven by our environment. So what could it be? Well, maybe autism itself isn't new or rising at all. Maybe it's just that we've got better at naming it. 
For most of history, it just simply didn't have a name. And the way we've now been diagnosing people over the last hundred years has changed a lot, which means people who would have previously been missed are now being counted as autistic. The best way I could think to explain this is with Lego. This white card represents everyone who's autistic and the Lego pieces represent people. We're gonna need a lot more Lego pieces to represent everyone. The majority of people don't have autism, but all of the Lego pieces on the white card represent people with autism. Before 1943, we didn't know what to call these people. So in other words, they were there, but just invisible. In 1944, American psychiatrist Leo Kanner published a study of 11 children with unusual behaviours, difficulty communicating and unusual sensory responses. He called it early infantile autism. And suddenly, almost overnight, a small proportion of these people on the white card now are seen and have a name, autism. I'll represent those who have officially been labelled as having autism with a yellow highlight. At first, very few autism diagnoses were made. Most kids were actually mislabeled as schizophrenic. But slowly, over time, more doctors began recognizing Kanner's definition. And by 1966, the first population-wide study was done, and it showed only 4.5 people in every 10,000 had autism. But this was still picking up people labeled as autistic using Kanner's very narrow definition and criteria. The rest of these Lego pieces on the white card were still being missed and were invisible still. Then in the 1980s and 1990s, the medical textbooks broadened their definition of autism. Suddenly, kids with less obvious traits were finally seen and were counted as autistic. In 1994, Asperger's was officially recognized as part of the autism family, which included more people. And by the early 2000s, pediatric screening became routine. Awareness grew, stigma shrank. Even adults who had slipped through the cracks initially started seeking diagnoses. And crucially, all of this helped correct disparities too, because historically non-white children so black, Hispanic and Asian, were misdiagnosed or missed entirely. But with increased awareness, over time, these people are no longer invisible. They're no longer being missed. And now here we are. The CDC says today about one in 31 children are diagnosed with autism. But that doesn't mean that more people have autism. It means that more people are finally being recognized and seen. Fundamentally, the number of Lego pieces on the card has not changed. We've just started shining a light on these people. Of course, not everyone agrees, and RFK Jr. calls this insulting. Doctors and therapists in the past were not stupid. His main argument is that the number of people with severe autism, known as profound autism, is increasing, and it's impossible for doctors to have been missing all of these cases. Screaming, biting, headbanging, violent. We never saw kids like that in the 60s and 70s. We just, and to this day, I have never seen somebody my age 68 years old who has full-blown autism where are they now i'm not sure if rfk has ever actually met a person with autism because beyond that description being wild when you actually look at the data this narrative is simply not true this study looked at how common profound autism actually is in the us and relative to the non-profound cases it's hardly increased population studies show the steepest increases are in autism without intellectual disability so in other words the rising number in autism cases is from those people who were historically just overlooked who don't need as much support as those with profound autism, but are still autistic. It's not that suddenly more people are now becoming autistic. It's that we now finally have the tools, the language, and the awareness to recognize those that were missed. And that reframes this whole entire story. So where does that leave us? RFK calls the rise in autism diagnoses an epidemic, but that's the wrong word. Epidemic implies disease, something contagious, something to fear. Autism is none of those things. The real epidemic is the people we're failing by describing this as an epidemic. I think autism is a disability. It's certainly not a disease. But my view is that autism in and of itself is only a disability because society makes it that way. Young people are growing up internalizing the idea that they're broken, that because their brain works differently, their potential is somehow capped. Parents are being told that their child's autism was preventable, that they're somehow to blame. And instead of support, they're handed fear, fear of toxins, fear of vaccines, fear of the environment, fear of autism itself. And we're already seeing the fallout of this. The declining vaccination rate in the US worrying health experts. The state is looking to end all vaccine mandates. The truth is everything you've been told about autism is wrong. Autism has always existed. We're just much better at seeing it now. This rise in autism cases is not caused by toxins. It's not a disease to be eradicated and it's not a burden. Cognitive diversity is how society adapts, innovates and survives. And history proves it. If we look back in history, autistic people have always been around. Of course, we only know historically about the successful autistic people because that's the only people that are recorded in history. So we don't know what Joe the blacksmith 
in Glasgow in the 1600s did with his time, because he's never been recorded. But we know about Sir Isaac Newton, for example, he would almost certainly have attracted a autism diagnosis today. Mm. We know about Albert Einstein, we know about Nikolai Tesla. Some of the greatest breakthroughs in human history came from people who saw the world differently. And today, by telling autistic people that they're broken, we risk missing out on the next Einstein, the next innovator who reshapes our world. When I diagnosed young people who were autistic, when I identified them as autistic, I would generally say congratulations, welcome to the club. Autism was never the crisis. The crisis is the way we've chosen to see it. And until that changes, it's not autistic people who are failing society. It's society that is failing autistic people. I hope you enjoyed the video and please consider subscribing to the channel to support me in my mission to create journalistically rigorous evidence-based medical content. My name is Esh, I'm a medical doctor and I create these videos alongside my full-time job to help you cut through the noise, to show you what's real, what's hype and what the science actually says about the viral health claims you see online. So please consider subscribing to the channel, honestly it means the world to me. You can watch a previous video I made on why it seems like everything now causes cancer here. Until next time and see you soon.